So it's, it's probably more than like uh, uh, like the, our age. Probably most of us are like even younger than that. Than that. So he's been there for a long, long time. And while he has been there, he worked all across the ocean and all sorts of oceans, in Indian Ocean, in Pacific Ocean, in um, Atlantic Ocean, looking at the reefs and specifically around Bahamas, Jamaica, Belize, Gulf of Mexico, Maldives, and the Great Barrier Reef and Gulf of Papua. So these were all the different like locations where he has studied these reefs and and uh, and the sediments uh, accumulating on the slopes and basins around these reefs. The main focus of his research has been the regional and global evolution of coral reefs, the paleoceanographic and climate and sea level records archived in the sediments deposited around the reefs and the carbonate platforms at different time scales. And, and, uh, and his first project on land was actually my PhD project where we actually looked at 500 million years old uh, reefs in central Texas, uh, which was his first ever project on land. And, and all of this research he has conducted was funded by uh, either National Science Foundation or um, American Chemical Society and numerous oil companies like throughout the past 30, 30 odd years. And among all of these, like uh, past 33 years, he has published more than 100 scientific publications and, and has edited two books, including the Earth's Climate and Orbital Eccentricity, the Marine Isotope Stage 11 question. 2003. So it is great. It is a great pleasure to have you, Andre, and uh, I give you the floor now to uh, to continue with the talk. We welcome you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Good evening. Here it is. Good morning. It's uh, 7 a.m. The sun is coming up here in Central Texas. Thank you very much, Pankaj, for this uh, introduction. It's it's really wonderful not to hear my last PhD student to introduce me today. Uh, and um, I welcome everyone. Yes, most of you are from, um, from uh, Mumbai, from Somaya uh, College. And um, today I'm going to talk about a special topic that I have been developing you know, through, the, uh, through the years, the glacial origin of barrier reef along low latitude mix classic and carbonate continental shelf edges. This, um, okay, oh, sorry. So this topic was the was the write up that um, I I wrote, you know, with a friend of mine and also a, a colleague of mine who is now. Uh, in France at Ephemer, Stéphane Joy. We did this in 2013, and today I'm going to, uh, to use the, the framework of this paper, but with more illustration to talk about this, the origin of barrier reef, which is always a very interesting you know, kind of topic. It has been a, an interesting topic for the last century, century or more, yes? Okay. So, here a map which uh, shows areas where we are. You see Houston. I'm not exactly in Houston myself. I am in central Texas, about five hours northwest of Houston, in the middle of nowhere. I'm now living in the countryside in an old farmhouse renovated. And today, by the way, it's a very special day because it's my, officially my last day as an active professor at Rice University. Tomorrow, officially, I will be retired after 33 years. And a new life is starting with me. I have new project uh, coming up. And so it's a very interesting uh, new beginning. I see Mumbai there. And you can see Switzerland, where I grew up. I grew born and, and raised there in the Jura Mountains. Uh, as Pankaj mentioned in the introduction, I was there. I was there until my master's degrees, which was in pure geology. And uh, in 1978, I moved to University of Miami and uh, became an oceanographer and marine geologist, which was a dream for me. And now after 40 years and plus in doing so, 
I'm still highly involved in marine geology oceanography and I really love it. Okay, today we are going to talk about two areas. One is central Belize on the, the eastern margin of, of the Yucatan Peninsula and also the Gulf of Papua. These are the two areas where we are going to spend time in the next hour learning about variables. So, good question. If I would have an audience in front of me, I would say, so what is a ring? And most of the students, most of the audience uh, would say, well, you think immediately of a reef. You think about, you know, the great reef. You think about other reefs. But you think probably if you are in, um, if you are in, uh, in India, you think maybe of the Maldives or the Maldives, but really a reef itself, you know, it's um, very interesting. And if you if you think if you were, I guess, aware of this very huge uh, oil spill that occurred in 1989 by a tanker called the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. And it says, you know, shortly after midnight on March 24, 1989, the super tanker collided with light reef, a well-known navigation hazard. And you would say, a reef in, in Alaska? This is pretty interesting, yes? It's not really what you would think about it. So you can see here on this nautical chart, you can see this light blue area, which shows that it's, it, and, and where it's, the beacon is located where light reef is in order to be sure that a captain will not approach that area because a reef, it's really a nautical term. It's a positive relief on a sea floor, shallow enough and hard enough to sink the boat. So a reef by definition is a hazard, a nautical hazard. Okay, let's kind of now go to my favorite Barrier, barrier. The Belize Barrier Reef is, is a beautiful place, as I mentioned before, on the, uh, on the eastern margin of, of Yucatan. So what is the Barrier Reef? Yes. So if I now put, you know, kind of here, so let me start, you, know, you see you know, this the green line there. This is not really a barrier there. This is a reef that is attached to a peninsula. So this would be a, a reef which is not will really be disconnected from the land. Yes, it's a fringing reef. On the other hand, I put my blue line here and this is a typical barrier reef because it is completely separated by the, from the land, from the coast, and it's separated uh, between the land and the barrier itself by a lagoon. So this is the definition of a barrier reef. If you, you focus now on the central part of this barrier reef in Belize, here you are, have another satellite image, and you can see beautifully how this barrier is developed. You can see very nicely how no, it piece of, of, um, of land and uh, of land of, of reef, and you can see you know, kind of how we, like it is there and here. And now if I focus in the southern part of the central barrier reef there to give you a sense of the of the complexity of this system where you have the barrier itself here which is discontinuous it is cut you know, by some channels there on the other hand for the south you can see it's a fully uh, continuous barrier it creates this amazing energy barrier where the waves would come and crash from the, the open ba basin to the reef itself, to the pavement. And now behind it, you will see this very complex patch of reef, patch reefs, all these little dots are patch reefs, and also very un interesting reefs, at least in Belize, we have this reef here, which are behind the barrier and show this very interesting geometry of diamond, diamond shape rhomboid reef-like, and they are called the rhomboid reefs, and we are going to talk about this at some point during this presentation. 
Okay. I cannot talk about Barrier Reef without showing you here the Great Barrier Reef. As a matter of fact, this satellite image here is only one part of the Great Barrier Reef. It's 2,500 kilometers long. It is the largest organism being observed. And that's kind of a very interesting fact that, for instance, when the American astronaut in the late uh, 60s and early 70s were on the moon, they could really see you know, the Great Barrier Reef. It is so long, yes. If I show you here a map of where the Great Barrier Reef is located, you can see Northeast Australia, Papua New Guinea, and you see you know, kind of here this very long barrier reef that stretched from about you know, 8 degrees south all the way to here. So this is about 2,500 kilometers. Another barrier reef that is quite large and uh, often ignored is the barrier reef around New, Cal New Caledonia. This reef is, this barrier reef is about 1,500 kilometers. Okay, so here, a uh, satellite image of New Caledonia. Uh, you have this very large, very elongated island called La Grande Terre in French. It's a French territory. And you can see in light blue this beautiful So if you see now the northern part of the island, you can see beautifully this barrier, this elongated barrier here known here by different channels and so the deep dark blue and here the lagoon uh, now separated by uh, oh uh, separated by you know, kind of these two reefs on the on the other side of it yes okay here that's a very interesting image here this is a figure that was published in 1842 by Charles Darwin. And you can see already at this time in the early uh, 1800, uh, you can see that the British Navy had already mapped very beautifully these reefs, not because they were interested in the reef themselves, only because they were a major hazard for navigation. All right, why do I bring Darwin here? Well, here I bring young Darwin, he doesn't look like uh, the Darwin we know, usually in publication. So this is young Darwin when he was probably in his late 20s. And uh, Darwin was born in 1809 and died in 1882. And this is kind of the Darwin we know often in pictures at the end of his life. It's known mostly for his, um, for his, his famous publication on the evolution of species, but Darwin was really a geologist to start with, and um, he did amazing, you know, things about about geology, and in particular, his first publication was in 1842, and his publication was entitled "The Structure and Distribution of God." So now put yourself uh, uh, into 1842. That's quite some time ago. As a matter of fact, it's about the time when Central Texas was uh, was settled by German uh, German uh, population. So, and at that time, in all the uh, here in Central Texas, the Comanche Indians, we call them Indians here, the native Indians, uh, were already still roaming you know, this part of, the, of North America, only 150 years ago. Okay, okay. He did, did this incredible, uh, so he created a map of the, um, of the, the distribution of all the reefs on Earth. So you can see, you know, here is map that covers the entire world. He had spent five years on the Beagle, traveling from England all the way around the world through Chile and the Pacific, 
And uh, when and visit only one reef, he only visited one reef here in Tokas, there in the southeast part of, Indian, uh, of the Indian Ocean. But in his publication in 1840, he published this beautiful map, magic. This is the first map ever published showing the full global distribution of reefs. Uh, how did he do this? It is this mostly by mostly this by probably looking at charts. So in terms of being able to navigate around the world on the Beagle, they might have had the most uh, elaborate collection of charts, nautical charts, and probably Darwin was, and this is kind of my idea, I guess, but probably Darwin was completely bored to death when he was navigating to the Pacific. So what he did, he compiled on this amazing map where the structure, the distribution of reefs around the world is. Not only this, he also separated You, the, the dark blue are atolls, the uh, light blue are barrier reef, and the pink are fringing reef. So he separated these reefs in three categories, and um, today we are going to focus on barrier reef. Yes. Okay, so the first identification or separation of these different types of reefs uh, are have their origin in this publication in 1842. And if you see, you know, kind of here is zoom into this map and, and the details of this map is pretty incredible. Uh, so the light blue colors are the barrier reef. You can see here with the great barrier reef there. And it's also kind of in, in this publication here around uh, New, New Caledonia. So here the world map of really strong uh, on the origin of Barrier What you know we see on uh, on the edge of the of the margin, the continental margin, with often or all the time still see plastics, we see barrier reef, like in Belize or on a great barrier reef. And uh, interesting enough. The morphology of this reef often mimic the underlying low sand silicyclastic coastal deposits. So the, uh, the theme is that the reef themselves have now used an old low sand silicyclastic coastal deposit to establish themselves, and therefore the modern, the modern reefs mimic an old silicyclastic coastline, which occurred during low sand when sea level was, at least in a late quaternary, about as, 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 as fallen about 120 meters below more than sea level. So what we also are going to talk about is early transgression. So do, from a low stand situation through this major transgression, we call this a window of opportunity for reefs to grow. At the time of the transgression, at the time of sea level rise, now the coastline, the silicic plastic coastline, is pushed up depth away from the modern shelf edge, which was the old silicic plastic uh, coastline during low stand. Silicic plastic being pushed away from the, this new continental shelf edge. Now uh, it becomes this amazing location for reefs in low latitudes, for coral reefs to establish themselves. And uh, now, during this transgression, and in particular also during high stand, these reefs not only were established, but they can evolve and they can grow, and because they are away from these silicic plastics. During low stand, because you might know, and we are going to talk about this, sea level has gone up and down with very high amplitude, amplitude of about 120 meters. And in the last 500,000 years, sea level went up and down 
because of the major late quaternary glaciation at a frequency of about 100,000 years. In fact, like today you know, we are in a high stand. We are at a time when the glaciers are quite uh, limited in, in their extension. But 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, we had major ice sheets, uh, but also in, uh, in Scandinavia, in Siberia, the, the major um, ice sheets in Antarctica had grown all the way to the south edge, and this huge amount of volume of ice uh, was formed by water taken out of the ocean and sea level had dropped about 120 meters. If you would be here in the US, I me would mention that Chicago at that time, 20,000 years ago, was about you know, under a kilometer or one and a half kilometer of ice. It's pretty incredible to think that it's only 20,000 years ago that we had this situation on Earth where we had a major, major glaciation. 20,000 years ago, imagine. Try not to imagine this is, if you are a geologist, 20,000 years ago is just a blink of an eye when you think that the Earth is 4.5 billion. And so it's kind of, to think that the Earth climate system can change from a major glaciation to an, a glaciation, uh, uh, to an interglacial as we have you know, kind of today during the Holocene. Okay. So, and we are going to also talk about that the modern coral reef system, the one we know now, was established sometimes in the mid bruns The mid bruns it's a way not kind of to talk about time. The bruns is the, uh, the normal polarity epoch that started uh, 790,000 years ago. And so the mid bruns would be about 450,000 years ago. Okay. So during the mid prince this is the time when most of this modern barrier reef you know, kind of started. So hopefully I will have time to, to talk about this at the end of my talk. So in a mixed carbonate silicyclastic system, low latitude, this is a schematic diagram showing that reefs are very picky. Coral reef today are picky. They need very special conditions. They need special conditions in temperature. The uh, optimum temperature will be about 25 to 29 degrees Celsius. They need open marine salinity, about 25 to 35 degrees uh, per thousand. They need low nutrients, which is something that people are not, 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 not. No, low nutrients is one of the conditions for coral reef to be able to establish themselves and grow. So the nutrients could become, could come you know, from the deep ocean uh, through upwelling. So you reefs, coral reefs are not in upwelling. But nutrients also can come from the coast. So the continental input not only bring fresh water into the, the shell, but also siliciclastic sediments and also nutrients. So all of this are uh, the conditions for reefs to thrive on the edge of the continental shelf. They have to be away from fresh water, away from siliciclastic, and away from nutrients, and have these very special conditions of temperature and salinity. We do know about, about the temperature effects, the limit of the temperature. When the temperature, and we have observed this in the past few decades, when the temperature increased slightly more than 29 degrees for several weeks or months, the reefs, the corals have a tendency to bleach, it means kind of they take away their zooxanthellids, these algae that live in the, uh, in the organism, in the tissues of the corals, and these algae uh, are creating an environment where the reefs can live in low nutrients environment. And the, this those antelids living in the tissues of the corals are a limitation for the corals in order to to be for them to be located in very shallow water because this those antelids needs the light to be able to live. So then the corals need to live within the body zone. If 
you see here a, a, a picture of part of the Great Barrier Reef, and you see this river called the Vatican River doing a major flood in 2010. And you can see this plume of CDC plastic coming in at the mouth of the Vatican, Vatican Rivers. This plume is now going offshore, but it's also going to be transported towards the northwest and in by a current. And because of this, now this reef here, the barrier reef here, even this reef there, you can see, you know, very close by this plume on the southeast part of this plume, this reef can be nicely growing away from this, this, this it's a plastic because if I take my arrow out, you can see how green coastal waters are. This green shows that this was not only kind of low salinity water, but also probably enriched in nutrients. So currents like this, coastal currents, are very important in order to uh, for the blooms of nutrients and fresh water to remain along the coastline, which allows this reef, the Great Barrier Reef, to grow healthy on the edge of the shelf. Belize, this is the delta of the Belize River. And you can see again here, uh, this was the old Belize River there. And in order to try not to avoid major flooding of Belize City, on the, on, on the, on the, on the, on the, is the delta of Belize City. So the river comes from here. And so now all of this area here, all of this coastline is a city plastic coastline. And uh, so this city plastic coastline is uh, interesting enough because if you now look you know, here at the full west eastern margin of the Yucatan Peninsula, so this would be Mexico here. Cancun would be the areas. Cozumel, probably you've never heard of Cozumel, but maybe Cancun is a place where American tourists would go on a regular basis to see the blue, blue water of the Caribbean. And so here is the country of Belize, and here are the Maya Mountains. So you have a series of reef, fringing reef here, and offshore platforms like these. But you see, the location of the Barrier Reef is only where you have the Maya Mountains, meaning where you have this flux of or this source of CDC plastics. So there's no Barrier Reef for the north because there's no source of CDC plastic. This is a pure carbonate system. system, system. Okay. So as I mentioned already, this, on a global scale, these barrier reefs were established during the uh, mid-burns, but on top of some early burns, those ten cities of plastic coastline. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. So, if now you look at the, um, if you look you know, here at the coastline of Belize, I put no kind of this uh, 90 degrees, I rotated a bit. So this is the delta of the Belize River. So north is on your left. And you can see that this delta here is you know, through this major current going from north to south is reworking this silicic plastic and creating all these beach ridges there. And you can see you know, kind of these beach ridges, a series of them. You have one here, one here, one there. These beach ridges are reworking of these silicic plastic sediments along the coast, yes. Here, a small delta that goes and covers these beach ridges there, telling you that these beach ridges are probably quite old, probably not going to be for generally in ages. But I'm showing you, you know, this modern coastal system here in Belize, in the central Belize uh, uh, barrier reef, 
and uh, I'm trying to now. Okay, here you see the offshore reef and the shape of the reef here. Even the thickness of this barrier reef seems to remind you of the thickness of these beach ridges. So these are the modern coastal systems. So you could imagine that the modern barrier reef was established on something very similar to the modern CLC classic coastal system because it reminds us a lot about it. It's just the shape of it. And so the similarity between the morphology of the reef, the barrier reef, and the morphology of the modern reef kind of suggests to us that the substratum of this reef here had to be the low stand coastal system that existed most likely of doing these early burns. We mentioned already at the beginning of the talk that you know kind of this unusual black barrier reef or this diamond shaped like reef, these rhomboid reefs you know, from there. And interestingly enough, if you try not to compare you know, kind of this geometry with geometries of rivers in this one here, uh, uh, the Rio Negro in Brazil, kind of an interesting river, it's full of uh, humic uh, acid. Uh, organic matter, and so it makes you know, the rivers very black, why we call it Rio Negro, and now it merged into the Amazon, and you can see on the contrast between this black and this uh, Amazon, which is full of sediments coming in from the Andes, full of, of uh, sediment low, yes, here there's very little sediment low here, but you can see you know, kind of there, if I focus in that area there, a little bit out of focus, but you can see there, you can see this diamond shape system of levees and smaller depression between. You see these levees here because they've been colonized by trees or grass. Yes. And it's kind of interesting if now you bring in you know, kind of these geometries of the Rio Negro in Brazil, you see you know, kind of this great similarity between the Rombrid in, in the Belize Reef in the back of the yeah. So again, here you can make you know kind of this this uh, assumption that this reef here, this homeboard reef, you use as substratum a series of levees here, uh, very similar you know to the Rio Negro in Brazil. So we we would have you know during low stand a fluvial system that existed very similar to the Rio Negro, and during the, the deglaciation, during the transgression, these levees became colonized you know, by reefs. And we're going to talk about this at the end of, the, of my presentation in more details. But even here, if you look at the Rambouille degree, and a former student of mine, Elmer Ferro, did some seismic, you know, kind of here, and interpreted this for his PhD. And these are incised valleys that existed during those time. And this inside valley here are now merging into this channel between these homeboard reefs there. If you look at a seismic line there, you can see that this inside valley would be you know, here. This is the interpretation of this seismic line there. And on the edge of this inside valley, you see these little bits, uh, this, this very, uh, steep and high, this is highly exaggerated, uh, vertically, you know, it's 23 times, so it's a reason why it's so needle-like, but these are drowned reef that grew on top of these levees, as, you know, kind of, if these, these reefs would have grown all the way to sea level, they would show, you know, kind of what we see for the south, you know, kind of this fully developed corporate reef. So, most likely, this reef, you know, here, this Mi this reef, this homeboard reef, it mimics so well this uh, levee system, a uh, peculiar system to those land, uh, are now uh, mimicking you know, kind of the, the shape of it. Okay. So let's go into another area, the Gulf of Papua. This is an area where we have been doing a lot of work, especially since um, you know early 2000. This big island here is the big island of Papua New Guinea the largest island, I guess, on Earth. Uh, you can see it looks like almost like a turkey. You know, it's heavier, it's still there. Uh, so 
Papua New Guinea is very interesting not because it has these very high mountains. You can see this on 4,500 meters, even 48, 84 meters. This is higher than the Alps. But it's also located, okay, um, I forgot to mention. So this would be a series of rivers. One of them is the Fly River that comes into the Gulf of Papua. And so in terms of its location, it's slightly south of the equator. So you have a large rainfall here, the monsoon system here bring large amount of precipitation, about 10 meters per year. And with this very high elevation, create a huge source of silicic plastic that ends up here in the Gulf of Papua. This here is the northeast peninsula of Queensland, the northeast part of, of Australia, yes, just to give you a sense where you are. So now if you go and zoom into the Gulf of Papua, you see on kind of this eye high elevated area here in the, in the Gulf of Papua, uh, so sorry, in the uh, Papua New Guinea. And this is the delta of the Fly River. And there are many small rivers here that bring a large amount of CLC plastic in the Gulf of Papua. Here, in this color there, this is the northern extremity of the Great Barrier Reef. So no reef when you have a lot of mud coming in on the Gulf of Papua. Yes. So this is a bathymetric map of the Gulf of Papua. We did a series of research cruises in a, from about 2002 to 2000, 2006. And so here, what we you see in terms of the, um, I'm trying to visit with my, so here we have the colors, the brown is 50 meters deep, the red is about down to 120 meters. So this is a shelf edge there. In blue, this is, the northern extremity of the Quebec Reef. You can see there's no reef here in the Gulf of Papua because you have these huge clumps of CFC plastics. I'm going to bring you, oh, and before I uh, bring you into these two areas there, you can see here even this is the uh, south uh, east peninsula of Papua New Guinea. This is the capital of Papua New Guinea, Port Mosby. The shelf here is much narrower, but you can see also in light blue, a beautiful barrier reef there. And this barrier reef ends here. There's the Great Barrier Reef ends here. So let's go now to uh, to two zones. This zone here, where we have uh, the reef, the barrier reef is up here, and as well not kind of here, our offshore Ashmore Park. So let's start kind of. We are now here in this zone of transition where we have a reef, and after we have no more reefs. So let's go there. So here, if I show you a seismic line, it's a 3.5 kilohertz seismic line, and you go from uh, A to B, from northwest to southeast, you are going to have this here. This is already interpreted. And so here, this is the, the sea floor. And we could see on this little edifice, uh, maybe, I mean, drawn in red, and this edifice are established on an unconformity. And here you see dipping reflectors. And these dipping reflectors have been eroded. And on top of this unconformity, now you have this reef. I, I mentioned reef already, but uh, edifice. And because we have, we are looking up to call this and found out that yes, not only these red edifice here are edifice filled up by cars, all right? If now I go now to a line, which is a deep line, this would be a strike line, yes, along the uh, continental margin. Here it's a deep line crossing the, the edge of the continental margin or the shelf edge. And you can see now here, this is a sea floor there. So from B prime to B, from B prime to B, and you can see here that these, uh, you see a series of prograding packages, which are now eroded. And on top of this unconformity, erosive unconformity, now you have the growth of one of these edifices. And this is where on this core taken by the Mayan Reef Hand, uh, MD45, where we just tapped on, on this edifice here. So also I want to mention that sea level 
would have been at minus 125 meters 20,000 years ago and you can see it's where sea level would have been there so these prograding packages not going there uh, occurred during the fall of sea level and uh, this would be the maximum sea level fall and now during the transgression on this erosive and conformity you would have not a growth of these of these reefs like you see them here and I already kind of show you here a bit too early but you are very lucky enough that at the end of this core here as a matter of but uh, in fact, it was not really in a core itself, it was in a cone of this giant piston core that we use in a dock in, um, on the Mariana Friend. At 110 meters, we recovered this. And this is a, a colony, a coral colony in situ, uh, in living position, and uh, based on, on the organization of, of these corals here, we can identify it as a Pavid pavitus, which is a shallow water uh, species and living in very high energy. So we knew that here, this edifice here was built you know, by the cores. The core not only had this colony uh, of Pavid pavitus there, and this is a work you know, by one of my former PhD students, uh, <coughs> uh, Hopper, uh, Brandon Hopper, and so here would be you now this colony that we saw already there in the, uh, in the cone. But through the, the core, you can see all these different types of cores. So the, so the 14 meter core, you can see you know, kind of these interesting assemblages of cores. These are very shallow cores, and slowly going up section, you see that this these species of corals become uh, species that live deeper and deeper and at some point these corals don't exist anymore in the corals. And so so we have the shallow water assemblages which is uh, wooded up probably about 0 to 3 meters and this medium water assemblages in 25 to 50 meters and we have more varieties there and after this we have a deep water assemblages between 15 and 30 meters. Um, so and after, at the very end, you know, we have algae that encrust the system, there are microbialites and farms that tell us that you know, this edifice end up, you know, kind of drowned, meaning it was completely disconnected from the, uh, the product cycle. So now what do we need to know? We know first that the, uh, uh, this assemblage just shows that we have the beginning of the reef. It was extremely shallow at the beginning. What we need to know next is really not going to know about the timing of this. So, beautiful in corals, especially the one, the coral colon colonies that are uh, preserving their original mineralogy, argonite. And lucky us, these corals are very, uh, are very much argonitic still. They have not uh, been altered dynamically into calcite. So we can use uranium thorium dates. And so this Favid Favides here was dated uh, at 19.3 thousand years ago, as I mentioned, you know, I said 110 meters uh, of uh, below more than sea level. And so we did you know a few more further up the core at 18,000 and the, the one uh, that we dated at about 109 meters below more than sea level, we uh, dated this at about 16,000 years ago. So we know that these Corals went from shallow to medium depth, higher water depth to kind of deeper water depth, and they went in times from 19,000 <coughs> to about 16,000 years ago. So, if now you put into in this knowledge, this data, into the context of a sea level curve, this is a sea level curve in the last 20,000 years, about 25,000 years ago. This is today. Sea level didn't go up. Uh, to modern sea level in a very linear fashion, but it went up you know, by steps. This step here at 19,000 years, and then you know, this step here, in terms of, of rise of sea level, 19,000 years, sea level remained more or less constant. It go and rise again very fast, uh, meters per century, 
bring the melt product of Swan A and uh, slow down again. This is what we call a defect of the younger trias. And uh, now at the end of the younger trias, we, we have a symmetric fiber syllable for the metro of pulse point E, where again, the syllable was rising very fast. So interesting enough, what do we know about now our calls that we call here on this, at the very end of this 4 and 45? It was 19,000 years, and it was about 110 meters. Uh, below more than sea level, so it fits very nicely within this uh, metropolitan uh, uh, period. So this generation of reefs that grew on top of this erosive unconformity is really dated at the very beginning of the transgression of the deviation rise of sea level. It crowns most likely just at the end of this metropolitan or during this time or this metal water bottle here 14.5 thousand years ago. So the system kind of was left behind. And now the, the reef backstep and continue to grow you know, further towards the southeast. So you see you now this very large reef system there. And this grew you know, during this metal water pulse 1A. And just after that metal water pulse, we, what we call the boiling Albert. And this part here drowned again when uh, metwater pulse, uh, the rise of sea level was so fast that the metwater pulse, uh, during this metwater pulse 1B, this part of the reef drowned and only these reefs continue to grow in a very part of this, in a very southeast part of this system here. And as a matter of fact, this reef here, which is almost at sea level, it's the slope of this modern reef, not kind of there, this broad reef that we have there. As a matter of fact, we didn't know when we went on a cruise of this reef, uh, the existence of this reef, and you can imagine that uh, the captain was very unhappy when we passed you know, this reef in such stuff or areas. Okay, so here we have demonstrated very nicely that yes, coral reefs are established on top of a low stand sh uh, delta which was established during the last glacial maximum on the shelf edge and the reef grew during this deglacial part of uh, the rise of sea level since last glacial maximum. Okay, so here I put my, kind of my line showing you know kind of this different step of the evolution of it. Okay, if we go down to the other side of the Gulf of Papua, and we go on the edge of the shelf edge there. Uh, this is Ashmo Reef, so this is called Ashmo, Ashmo Trough. So we are here on the northern extremity of the Great Barrier Reef. And we go on the shelf edge there, we zoom into it, and what do we see? It is, we, it, we see here you know, a very, very beautiful ridge there. So the, the red is the shallow color, it's about 65 meters uh, of water depth. And you can see it's about 50 kilometers in length and it's very narrow and we do think that not only this is an old reef that grew on the shelf edge or on this delta edge of this of this beautiful delta here which is probably the uh, the low sand delta of the fly river this is the channel of the fly river and so th this nicely developed reef not kind of there uh, occurred most likely you know, during the deglaciation, as on the other side. So, as I said, not enough. This ridge is about you know, 50 meters uh, in, in height, and is you know, kind of the, uh, it's 50 kilometers in length. Also, the uh, you can see how linear this reef is there. For eight kilometers, it's so linear that you would think, how can a, a reef be so, or a ground reef be so linear? It's only because it was established on a beach ridge that beach ridges are extremely you know, kind of linear as you might know. Okay, so we had a core you know, kind of there in a little, in a little cove. This core uh, shows uh, very shallow water carbonate, some CLC plastics, and of the of this you know pure carbonate there, the dates are between seventeen thousand to about eleven thousand years ago. And if you put you know, kind of this core there core bottom you know, would be there at 17,000 years so and now we would see it would go through this metal with a pulse 1A and at the very end 
put the metal parts one B, and this will be you know kind of this pure cost of carbonate when this reef uh, this is kind of on, on, the, on the bottom of the this reef, but when the system here became completely disconnected with silicon so plastics and uh, now uh, it's been found. So here a uh, 3D view of this reef, you know, highly exaggerated vertically. But here you can see nicely that on this beautiful shelf edge delta and on the edge of it this beautiful you know, kind of drowned reef that of that the big glacier uh, part of the last uh, glacier to interglacial uh, period. If I put so this is where we have our core and again kind of there the sea level curve from twenty thousand years to about ten thousand years and so this core would have oh, we covered material from seventeen thousand we this time just after that method of us from uh, at nineteen thousand so this is you know where this we have first carbon eight at the end of this method of us and after some silicon plastic here during this interval there and after you know this major drowning of this system uh, during the metal pulse one a and one b which comes up you know here at about 65 meters and this is what we have you know, kind of there the ed the, the highest point of this drowned reef is 65 meters if you take a seismic line you know kind of through this shelf edge you know, delta there what do we see so from northwest to southeast in the shelf to the basin here you can see you know this is our little uh, ground reef there on a shelf edge but if you look you know, kind of below the sea bottom to the sea floor you can see you know, this very high amplitude system with little reef like this or this really that we can interpret you know, as reef yes. so you can see that this reef high star probably edges this final form on the upper slope and so this would be a systematic uh, uh, cycles of sea level so this would be probably a carbonate pure carbonate system on a shelf edge now uh, sea level four so you create this this uh, uh programming packages or like this and if there are another one here here this very nice uh, ripple system uh, going on the shelf edge there you can see a series of this probably kind uh, of form on the episode made of CDC plastic and on the edge of this reef and this is the last one you can see and observe. Okay. Let's go now to Belize. Uh, and we will talk about you know, kind of the establishment of the reef there and hopefully you know, give you a sense of that the reef there was uh, initially formed four hundred and fifty thousand years ago. Okay. We are familiar with this now. So here is the central part of the Belize margin. Again here, the delta of the Belize River. We also notice that this delta is asymmetric. It's uh, it's being reworked from north to south. And you can see that from there, you see you know, how it is reworked and created on this beautiful beach ridges. This is the northern one. You can see some previous one not kind of there. And so the Belize River would have broken kind of its, its material, its load more here because of the longshore current. It would have been created, you create, you know, these beach ridges like this. Does. And when you see here the uh, the modern reef, you can see that this reef looks very similar to what we see here in terms of these beach ridges. So you can come with the reef as something to do with a shelf edge silicon plastic coastline that uh, was deposited during those time. And here we have this uh, unfilled incised valley, English Key Channel. And we will see that not of this a delta, an old delta here at the mouth of English Key Channel that was created during the last glacial maximum. And so uh, again, the there from north to south. And we work the delta. Here, Elmer Ferrer in his PhD, I had shown you before you know, his work in the southern part here, looking at this incised valley, completely you know, infilled and buried 
with by Holocene sediments that come in and merge into the channels between this mobility. And so, and if you go not up on the north side, if you go on the north side, not up there, you can see that there's a divide here. At now the drainage system is going northward. So this is doing your last glacial maximum. And now feed into the English Key Channel. And now uh, create a delta. And this delta is being reworked by currents towards the, uh, the south, like the modern delta of the this river that um, today know is reworked towards the south. So these drainage system doing low stand, so at that time the reef was the previous reef, the reef during um, uh, the previous interglacial during what we call the uh, marina stop stage 5e, this reef now was completely exposed, was classified, and now uh, this drainage system was bringing material in front of the uh, of this exposed reef, creating a delta and a deep sea fan, or at least we were for delta down into this basin towards the south. Okay, so if I go and I kind of into the details of this English key channel area here, so this is a figure of Thermoferro as in here. So here you have this English key channel there, and even there, the shape of the reef today mimics this former delta that existed during low time. So we have, we did, in the 90s, we did a series of seismic lines there. So the numbers here show not only these different seismic lines, some more proximal line, the 38, 30, which would be a more distal line, there's a 39 would be a deep line. And uh, here, this line 8401, it's an old line that was shot now by an old company by Tecton or Shell. All right, so here you see this delta, but also there you see this outline of the low sand delta and this now the delta has been reworked and you can see that here this low sand fan that was fed by the English key channel. Okay, so if I show you a deep line uh, number 39, this is a line drawing of this. You can see all these beautiful organic packages and this has to be so it's a plastic it's at the end at the mouth of this uh, English key channel. And now you see here a vibrant surface, a backstepping of this delta, and on top of it, this little edifice that I interpreted as part of it, that grew during the deglaciation, during the rise of sea level, since that glacial maximum. This here is the um, last glacial sea level at the So, and if I do interpretation here, so again, like we had in the Gulf of Papua, you can see that this providing packages of this shelf edge delta was eroded, and now during the <coughs> back when sea level goes back up, now the surface of this eroded shelf edge delta that occurred in elevation maximum now is becoming the substratum for this free access. So if now I make on uh, this line, this green line, 30, 30, this will be the, uh, the most proximal strike line for this low sand delta. And uh, the 36 will be slightly more uh, distal. So this is the proximal one. North is on the right. This is uh, south on the left. So you can see that, yes, now we have this very nice delta. This delta is at least kind of this accumulation of sediments there. It has been reworked toward the south, and uh, there's no sediments on the north side because the current would bring kind of this material towards the south. There, there are some permanent uh, reflectors, and these reflectors are going to be important because we can bring them to this. And again, sea level, see, it was 120 meters, so it shows very well that you know we have this delta in a proximal, slightly higher because of exposed delta. And so if I now show you the most distal that occurred, again from the north to south, what do you see? You see lobes, lobes of this delta that migrates from north to south. And again, this major reflector is not here All right? So I hope I convince you that at the mouth of English Channel, you have a beautiful 
low stand delta, on top of which reefs have grown during the decay stage. If now I show you this line, this deep line 8401, uh, so it is this deep line about there. So before now we could see the delta here on this seismic line. Now I'm going to show you how we can connect this seismic interpretation into this this uh, industry line there. And I'm showing you a, a line drawing of this. So now here we go from west to east. It's a deep line. Yes. So this is the depth of the lagoon. The lagoon is about 10, 15 meters there. Here, this is, or here would be the barrier reef today. This is a, what we call the black barrier. So this is a old carbonate. And what do we see there? Well, we see that, and the most prominent figures there is this beautiful. And these targeting packages there are now eroded. And during the time of erosion, and this is the work also by Elmer Ferrell uh, during his PhD. So when these, <coughs> these were beautiful forgetting packages, uh, now you erode them on the abject position. And now below Northern Modern Reef, you see these beautiful forgetting packages there. I put them now here in purple because I believe that all of this is silicic plastics, while all the brown would be what do we know about time here? Well, we don't know as much as we would like to. We are trying to, uh, to build this, which would have been, we will be. The day we can drill this, we can really prove our hypothesis that yes, all of this is ripple system established on this low stand series of silicic plastic in the kind of delta. Uh, and after this, this will be mostly silicic plastic during the Pliocene. Before I talk about this uh, interpretation here, we're going to come back to here in a second. But I want to show you that uh, it's not not only you know, one of the last reef that grew during the last glaciation since um, uh, last glaciation maximum 20,000 years ago, but most likely you know, grew uh, in a series of deglaciation in the last 500,000 years since the mid. In order to do this, because we don't have a core that really proved to us that the reef was established sometimes during the mid boring snow kind of there and was growing and exposed and growing and exposed and growing and exposed to this five major deglaciation in the last 500,000 years, we indirectly can show you, you that yes, the reef in Belize started sometimes in the mid -boring. And in doing so, we are lucky enough to bring the minor reef fan again. Uh, here, this core MD02.532 in Gladden Basin at 200 meters of fuller depth, a few kilometers. So, this is 10 kilometers, yes, I'd say about 10 kilometers you know, from the edge of the modern barrier reef. And so, if you show a seismic line from the reef into the basin there, this is the location of this core at 3300 watt. 333 meters, the core, only with a minor reef fan you can get this type of core length, about 38 meters long. And so here, if you look at the seismic, and this is some seismic we did, wow, well, in 1993, quite some time ago, a, a water gun, yes. And if you look, you know, kind of there, you, you see you know, this series of packages, I guess. And you can see the kind of the seismic is changing from the base, and kind of air, to this second part of the, of the core there is some kind of a change from there, yes. So from this, all of these materials here are sub-parallel and fairly, fairly um, transparent. And here you can see all these series of packages, yes. And see you know, from this surface here, you can see maybe one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to show you and zoom into this, yes. And so you have this major change in uh, in seismic uh, image there, where now from this horizon here, we have now this series of, of uh, wedges. And if you count them again, you can see about one, two, three, four, five, and maybe six, you know, kind of packages that are directly related you know, to 
the growth of the reef. At least that's what we think. So we this red horizon, the reef didn't exist. On the other hand, you know, kind of past this, um, this horizon, this is the initiation. So how can we prove this to you? So this core is a fabulous core, and Brooke uh, Carson did the work on this. So she did Delta O18 on, uh, on Planktic Parminifera, on Brupa, and um, did this fabulous record of Delta O18 there, for the, you know, down to 36 meters. Also, uh, this, so this is in depth. This is the um, this record that everybody would use, you know, the Lizeki and Remo Delta O2 curve, it's a stacked record. And so this is the best record we have in terms of uh, uh, also as volume, this authentic record. And so it's very close to a sea level curve. So what do we see kind of here? We see uh, at the top, um, we see the, um, you know, kind of, uh, the Holocene, I cannot move my, uh, I was trying to move my, my cursor here, okay, this is the Holocene, this is the previous interglacial time, from previous, you know, stage 5, stage 7, 8, 11, and you see, you know, kind of the earlier interglacial are not as prominent as the one from about the mid points of the 250,000 years ago. But what she was able to do, she was able to and with also stratigraphy, nanostratigraphy, and, uh, and carbon-14 dates, and also uh, planktic forms, you know, kind of stratigraphy, she was ab able to establish, you know, a comparison be between what we have now here in this reference uh, curve here, with Lizzie and Raymer, and here she was able to identify all the same, stage 5, 7, 9, 11, and again, here you can see what kind of the previous stages here 13, 15, you know, and 13, uh, 17. During the early brims, these stages here are not as prominent as these mid brims and late brims there, yes? Okay, so now uh, what's very interesting, you know, here you can do argonite content in this core. Argonite is only produced from the, uh, the neurotic environment, so this is fine sediments that have been produced on a reef and exported on this basin, in this basin. And you can see that kind of the argonite, and there's also here some high calcite, so the argonite curve here, this is mass accumulation of argonite, and he, here, this is high mica. And um, so this is now put in time, yes. So interesting enough, you know, our core, is recording the full uh, Bruins uh, epoch. And you can see that now kind of the argonite is still argonite during the early Bruins, but not as much as. Yes. On the other hand, the argonite start to increase uh, kind of there. And uh, it's really increasing, you know, at stage 11, 9, 7, 5, and today. So you have a increase of this argonite during this transition from the early bones to the mid bones, which gives us a sense that yes, the reef <coughs> started to grow on top of this CLC cluster, sometimes in the mid bones, in this first deviation between uh, termination uh, between stage, you know, top stage 12 and 11. Maybe you can argue yet, yet that the reef might have also kind of started to grow slightly earlier during stage 15 and 13 but never as much as it was uh, developed during stage 11 in the middle. Okay. I hope I'm not kind of taking too much of your time. So if you think about this curve that uh, Lizette and Remo uh, has used, but also in kind of Ken Miller did some uh, temperature uh, correction for these isotopes, and now came up now with a sea level curve, you can see that kind of during the early boom, sea level was never as high as the modern sea level. And the main the main deflation, the first one is between 12 and 11. And it's probably when these major reefs started to grow. At least until this major generation of reefs started to grow. So when you have a major falling of sea level during the early booms, 
and after a major transgression during the midpoints, and it's the time when this bit had to work. And now we have these recent barriers and back barrier we you know kind of since then every time that we have a, a high sea level of an information So if you go back and you kind of do this line here 8401, so we had seen this before. So now we can understand a bit better what's going on there. So this major forwarding packages there have to be sadistic plastic because the time when the Maya mountains became unroofed and uh, this is the first time that you really have this very large amount of sea plastic so early and early late Pliocene sea level was at that time you know, 20 to 30 meters higher than today and so now you have a long-term sea level fall which is the time of these prograding packages and also, when now you are depositing you know, this series of organic packages you know, kind of there on a down dip, we um, you know, kind of the roots, the roots of the um, of this establishment of the reef, sometimes in the mid-range, and create you know, kind of the modern that we have today. If you put this into the context of the sea level curve that you know, we are now extending all the way to five million years, since the onset of the major glaciation here, you have you know, this fall of sea level, systematic. Yes, you have some high stand there, uh, but not as high as whatever we have today. This is a line of the modern sea level. And so this is the early burns there. And it's at the time during MIS 11 that this week could have grown on top. During this fall of sea level, but also during this early burn there. Okay, so this is kind of to show you. Again, part of this is 1.5 million year sea level record. And now you can see that we remember we had um, counted five or six uh, wedge on our seismic line that would record you know, every time the reef would become active. So, you know, the Holocene one, two, five, our stage five, seven, and four and, and nine and eleven, so maybe six might be you know kind of this reef that grew during uh, stage eleven, uh, stage fifteen and thirteen. But this is the turnaround. Yes, you have this major fall of with the latest part of uh, the Pleistocene, and uh, sorry, not the, uh, the the latest part of the early Pleistocene, and here during the early brims, and now this is the turnaround when the reefs are growing on top of these silicy plastics. Okay. So, to, to conclude here, I'm going to show you one more example back on our rhomboid reefs. In this case of the rhomboid reefs, the beauty there, uh, Bob Ginsberg and um, my friend uh, Eberhard Gischler uh, published a paper in the 2010, and um, this paper uh, shows the interpretation of drilling of this uh, this um, this marble in reefs. Yes. So mixed carbonate silicy plastic in the quaternary of southern Belize, Pleistocene twenty point in reef development controlled by sea level change. Okay, here we see beautifully the southern part of the reef. North would be not kind of towards the uh, right. You can see here the marble reefs there. You can see these marble reefs they get still you know, kind of within the lagoon. And so Bob Ginsburg in 84 drilled you know, kind of this series of cores there, especially you know, kind of there. And so here I'm showing you the litter log of these uh, different sites. Now this is 8401, it's this is channel key there. This is the top of the drill there. This is the bottom. So they drilled about 67 meters or 68 meters. And what do we see? Everything in this type of colors, you know, from gray to green, to a, to a green, these are clay, all right? And yellow would be marl. And for this, grainstone, pack, so rocky stone, these are carbon. So you can see that the, the base of this core is mostly silicy plastic. And for this, you know, here, you have this series of packages full of cards, yes? The last, transition from this coal deposit to this one here, you know, which is shown by a, a, an exposure horizon. This is the Holocene on top of the five. 
on top of the seven and nine, and most likely we have them here. So if I go to now two, you can see the same thing here. And this is mostly brainstone, but again, it gets more and more into this type of color shown. Yes, all this default system there and brainstone system carbonate with a positive on top of this system there. And it goes back into the call. This one it was up. Oh, it was the uh, drill about 85 meters. Yes, and I'm going to show you one more. Uh, it's uh, 8404. Uh, uh, here, and you can see again. This is even more uh, illustrated, even better. The fact that not you have, and this is 81 meters. So you have CLC plastic, and after you have this package of reaper carbonate, sometimes not with a little bit of sensitivity. This will be the transition. This will be the very beginning of the Holocene on top of the five, most likely, not by reaper deposit. So if you put this, okay, another one here, here let me you know, kind of show you here the series of cores that uh, we have on these small boy reefs. You can see that not kind of now you have this base, which is mostly sensitive plastics, with the exception of the Barrier Reef here, which was never uh, was never invaded by CLC plastic because it was probably remained elevated most of the time. But the Wombard Reefs behind the reef are well uh, are well is CLC plastic, mostly mud, clay, and you know started on to grow on top of this CLC plastic there. And if you count them, just there would be about one to five packages of coral, uh, coral growth, yes. The dates here are, you know, difficult. I mean, to, to find the dates there, we, there are different methods, methods there, but uh, the dates seems kind of to, to fit very well uh, what uh, the interpretation has been for our interpretation for the, the these barrier reef itself through their, uh, the core uh, basin and the occurrence of argonite but so this CLC plastic would be deposited mostly you know kind of during this time of uh, the early booms <coughs> yes and after this you know kind of this ripple system would have grown on so the on the rhomboids you know doing this one two three four five you know kind of past them separated by it for the horizon so here you know, in the Belize, we feel that, yes, the reef here, this reef here is very young, and it's only, you know, kind of, uh, occurred first during the mid-booms, and was uh, established on top of this, uh, forbidding citizen plastic system. Okay. Well, it's not, uh, uh, it's not uncommon. As a matter of fact, it's very common that all these modern reefs, including the Great Barrow Reef, based on grading shows you not know, gonna be on that for the reef it's a the true reef here and this is the work you know, by uh Jody Webster uh, we consider that true tropical reef turn on or to about you know, later than about 452 to 365 so which is this mid prince yes um, and here same thing you know for the uh, the new Caledonia the reef themselves also kind of grew on top of CDC plastics, you know, and started not to, to grow in the mid -ones. And it occurs, you know, kind of, the CDC plastic is deposited here during the early brooms, and now, because this interglacial were never high enough to reflood, you kind of the, uh, reflood completely, you kind of the shelf, and so it's only during this 11 or 12 to 11 position, or maybe kind of 15, sometimes, you know, 13, uh, 11 when you have now this onset of the, uh, the barrier reef on top of the uh, of the CLC plastic. So, in summary, well, I'm kind of late, you know, here. Yes, the reefs today, the modern reef. The, the 
grief themselves grew during this mid bronze uh, transition uh, at about you know, 450,000 years and 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 years. It'll take, I think, just one, <laughs> one or two minutes for Andre to get back, uh, and, and obviously we all can't hear him, but I think he can still hear us. Uh, so I think he'll be back in a second. So, without him, I guess we will never have a good talk. Okay. Sounds good. We can hear you, Andre. So, Deepak, uh, yeah. do you want to take over? Uh, yeah, uh, I will take the poll. Uh, the first question, Andre, the first question is, uh, where can we find the oldest? The oldest? Uh, oldest barrier reef of the world. Where can we find the oldest barrier reefs of the world? Okay. All right. Well, uh, the oldest reefs, yes. Let's talk about reefs. Sometimes it's kind of not easy to find, you know, a barrier reef as such, unless, you know, to separate reefs from barrier and or to at all in the past, because in this case, you would need uh, either amazing exposures on land, or you would need a fantastic seismic coverage, yes? And we do have beautiful seismic coverage two times mostly because of oil and gas exploration. <coughs> so the oldest reef like, you know, uh, are kind of at the beginning of the uh, initial uh, life on Earth. As I mentioned, the Earth is 4.5 billion. And the first initiation of life on Earth is at least known because bacteria and microbes created deposit, calcium carbonate deposits, stromatolites, macrobiolites, and this was about 3.7 billion years ago, all right? And if now I go back, uh, come back, you know, kind of towards, you know, the recent time, for instance, kind of the work we have done in the upper Cambrian, 500 million years ago here on land, uh, we have beautiful reefs, and uh, uh, Pankaj would need, you know, kind of to give you uh, talk about those one day uh, because he has done a fabulous PhD on these and this is in Mason County where I live now where these reefs are amazingly uh, outcropping and so this would not be per se barrier reef but they are um, they are growing and some of them are 14 meters high they are growing on the shelf and create no kind of these elongated features and this could be considered as 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 barrier reef, yes, there. So, if I you now pursue uh, in the geological record, some of them that are very well known would be you known this barrier reef that we have here in West Texas, uh, in the Permian, fabulous, beautiful reefs. Um, if you would go, you no know, kind of to even during the Ordovician, if you would go to um, to um, Canada, the Canadian Rockies shows fabulous you know, reef system, which some of them could be considered as barrier reef. But um, here in Texas, you find also some very nice barrier reef in uh, very well developed during the Cretaceous. And these are made of ridges, so the reef themselves are not made of cores like they are today, but in this case, you know, in a Cretaceous, in, a, in, in, the, in the Albion Alp action, you have you know, this fabulous Scott City reef which is also you know, situated on CNC plastics. And so two times you see all you know, these series of reefs uh, on the shelf edge. And this reef on shelf edge often would have you know, this uh, behavior as elongated features and this could call barrier. So you can find this type of barrier like uh, almost through the entire geological you know, time. Okay, uh, that's a uh, great answer. Uh, the next question is, how a fringing reef or atolls are formed instead of a barrier reef? Ah, 
I wish I would have a, a diagram for this. And um, it was, I, I thought of giving you a talk of that topic, you know, the origin of atolls. Uh, probably all of you, if you have taken a, a course, an introductory, introductory course in other science, you might have learned one thing uh, in your study, is the origin of atolls. And this, you have to come back now in 1842 by Charles Darwin. And I didn't want to, to kind of extend, expand on this during this talk because it was, uh, the talk was focused on the barrier, yes? But Darwin was so, I mean, being so, his insight was very surprising. With the little information that he has, or he had at that time, uh, he came up not only with this beautiful map, you know, of um, of the reef. Um, let me see. You know, I, I'm not going to take this map while I'm talking, but sometimes I kind of talk and type. So I so you remember the map that oh here is Darwin Young and Darwin Old. I can be coming. Yeah, here this beautiful map. Yes. So here, no, he he was able to look at all this chart that he had. And um, in this chart, uh, you would see sometimes a volcano, and a volcano would have a fringing reef sometimes. So the, this exposed volcanic edifice, especially in the, in the Pacific, he will um, see sometimes a, an edifice, a volcanic edifice with a fringing reef, but sometimes it will be a bio reef, meaning that the fringing reef had evolved into a reef which was detached from the edifice, the volcanic edifice itself. And at the time, he could see an atoll, and I'm sorry I don't have no picture of an atoll here, but the, the definition of which enclosed a lagoon, and there's no more uh, volcanic edifice, yes. So he, he observed this, and with this in mind, uh, first he was able to identify you know, kind of these different types of reefs, yes? And so he felt, well, how do we go, and whoever asked the question, how do we go from fringing to atoll? So he not only spent time in the ocean, but he sp spent some time in Chile before going to the Galapagos. And in Chile, he witnessed a, an earthquake, and a major earthquake, and observed old stone, a port line, where you could see a motion, an uplift motion I along this fault zone. So in his brilliant mind, it became, uh, it, it was uh, obvious for him that continents are exposed on land, or on the earth, because they are uplifted. He was uh, well aware of that the ocean were very deep. At that time, we didn't know. They didn't know the depth of the ocean because they were still using a line to, uh, to measure depth. So they knew that it was well beyond, much deeper than what they could measure. But so he kept, he kept, he kept the deep ocean, at the ocean are deep because they are subsiding. So with this concept of uplifting, uplifted continents and subsiding ocean, and this observation that edifice, volcanic edifice sometimes are by themselves, sometimes you have a, a reef attached to it, a printing reef, sometimes a barrier reef, and sometimes an atoll. He came up now with this brilliant model where by subsidence, it could go and move. The subsidence of this volcanic edifice, the printing reef would become barrier, and the system would subside even more, and it would become, uh, the barrier would evolve into an atoll when now the reef is completely uh, covering this volcanic edifice. And I'm sure most of you, probably all of you, have seen that model before, yes? And probably most of us as teachers have also taught this beautiful model. It's very appealing, it's very easy. The, the, con the concept of it is so easy. But there's one major issue there, yes? And I wish I could ask you the question to the audience. What would be the major issue? Well, in the, the early 1800s, we were not, we didn't know anything about glaciation. 
We had no idea uh, that we had this major glaciation and there sea level, sea level change of 120 meters in amplitude in the last half million years. And the rate of sea level fall and the rate of sea level rise due to this melting and growing of ice sheets, we are talking about meters per century during this metwater pulse, probably one A, uh, you know, let you know now one A at 14 and 5,000 years ago, sea level was rising meters per century. If you look at the rate of subsidence of volcanic edifice, we are looking at you know, a very, very slow rate of subsidence. So we are talking about three order, two to three orders of magnitude <coughs> uh, of rate of subsidence, or even, s I mean, of, sorry, of sea level rise and sea, and sea level fall, while the subsidence in, you know, kind of is very minimum in terms of in this context. So. Well, in uh, during this pandemic, I finally, you know, with Stefan Jory, wrote a manuscript for the annual reviews of marine science, and it's been accepted on the origin of atolls, where we can show, I mean, clearly that the Darwin model is not adequate anymore in the context of sea level, and we can show that uh, during this, knowing now very well what sea level is, we can explain that these reefs, these atolls, formed on top of plateau banks during the early and late Pliocene. These plateau banks became exposed during the, uh, the early Pleistocene and early Bruce. They intensified, meaning because they were exposed, they would create topography, cast topography, where the inside of this reef would be uh, depressed because of the dissolution being more enhanced in the center of this reef, while the margin of this castified reef would be slightly elevated. So during this mid bruns when <coughs> sea level reflooded these castified reefs, now they would use the substratum of this castified system <coughs> and now would grow on the margin of this castified blocks, the elevated margin of this castified blocks. So we have great example you know, from the Maldives. The Maldives is the uh, mecca of atolls, as you might know. I did a lot of work in the Maldives myself. And, uh, but also we have example from a, a series of um, atolls in the, um, in the Pacific, and also some of the atolls that uh, Stefan Jory has been working on in the uh, southwest part of the Indian Ocean. The beauty of the, um, the atoll in the Pacific and they've reached north of the volcanic basement. But we can show that even though, that yes, there are, uh, this atoll are, um, have started at some point when the carbonate system has happened, you know, has grown on top of volcanic edifice, but they can grow on granite, they can grow on anything. Even the Maldives grew on top of this amazing uh, volcanic plateau. But the volcanic plateau is at two to three kilometers below modern sea level, and now you have a two to three kilometers sequence of shallow water carbonate with a very long term evolution of the carbonate system there. And that the atoll themselves, at the very, very late phase of this evolution of this large carbonate system in the Maldives, and it's only during, you know, kind of the last 500 to 400,000 years. So, so I'm hoping not to be able to come back when this is published probably in two or three months and tell you about more and illustrate uh, how more than I don't know. Phew, long answer. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was uh, a very detailed uh, answer. Uh, uh, moving to uh, the next uh, question, uh, perhaps this will be our uh, last question and uh, the rest of the participants can uh, mail their questions to uh, Andre later. So uh, Andre, the question is, could you share some info on eastern and western Indian coastal reef environment? Whew. Okay, so I don't know much about it. Let me see. Yes, I don't know anything about it besides one study that Pankaj had discovered in the literature. He had discovered that if you go on the uh, western margin of India, if you go on a shelf edge, 
uh, someone had observed little bumps on the shelf edge, yes? And so these would be uh, very similar to what we saw in the Gulf of Papua. So the shelf edge of the margin, the western margin of India, has a very similar drowned reef system like the one we have in the Gulf of Papua. Um, and so I do know that Pankaj at some point would like you know, to, uh, to, uh, to study this you know, with some of his colleagues from India because you know, these the glacial reefs on the shelf edge on the Celsiclastic low sand coastal system are probably all over the world. As a matter of fact, you know, there are a great example uh, of Shoma and Agasca, for Florida as well. So there are many places of all around the world when you have a, a mixed system, a mixed margin, the, uh, the turnaround when uh, you go from a, a low stand, uh, classic system, which is about 120 meters below modern sea level, which is for the modern uh, shelf edge, which was the old coastline, when this is reflooded, it's it's very um, systematic that now the CDC classic will be pushed up deep towards a new coastline. And why do you do this? You remove the CDC classic in a former, in, in a new shelf edge, in a former uh, low sand coastal system. And now this become uh, adequate environments for coral reef to grow. And use the substratum, the relief of this, of this this fire region as well. So, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Andre, uh, for uh, 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 a great information about the western coast uh, uh, reefs of India. Uh, we'll, oh, move, we'll move to the uh, ending of this session. I would like yep. uh, uh, Dr. Nyanada Salvi. Uh, for uh, a vote of thanks. Well, I thank you very much for everything. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you for Pankaj. Thank you for your patience. This is my first ever uh, Zoom presentation. It's it's a bit um, difficult for me who has been teaching in front of audience and not in front of my laptop. And I'm hoping that um, the Zoom system will be allow will allow us in the future to have direct interaction with whoever listened to this presentation. But I thank you again for uh, inviting me and thank you very much for your patience. And have a great evening. Yeah. My day is just starting. <laughs> yes. Nyanada, uh, heading over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Deepak, sir. Um, hello, Dr. Andre. It was yep. a listening to you today. Um, your photos, your images, they just they transported us across the world to these beautiful seaside states. Uh, a lot of us have learned something very new and interesting about reef architecture, about decoding reefs, to learn about the past climate. So thank you so much for taking the time to share all this work with us. It was really inspiring. Um, I, thank, I, I would like to thank the organizing members who were here today uh, and uh, to help set up this event for us. And of course, thank you so much, all the participants who waited patiently, uh, because we do have technical issues. These are our online platforms, and these things are bound to happen. So thank you for sticking around um, and showing your interest in the series of lectures. Uh, the feedback will be emailed to you, uh, emailed to all of you after this lecture. Um, our next lecture in this series will take place on Saturday, the 4th of July at 11 a.m. Uh, we have Dr. Alif Majumdar. He's a DART fellow, and now he's an assistant professor at uh, ISM Kimbar. He will share his work on plate boundary serpent nets. So from uh, Quaternary and Late Cenozoic Barrier Reefs today, we'll be traveling back to the Precambrian Passive Boundaries. Uh, we are looking forward to host all of you once again for that lecture. Thank you for being here. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Dr. Andre. We hope you have a wonderful day today and a very happy and fulfilling retirement. <laughs>